Am I directly in the way for over here? <laughs> See right through me, clear as mud? How's everybody doing? Yeah, not tired, not sleeping yet? It's warm in here, had lunch. It happens. My name is Peter Martinson. I'm the director of incident response for Blue Team Alpha. This is my colleague, Stefan Dorn. He's the director of offensive security. So he handles all the pen testing and, well, you tell him what you do. Pen testing, vulnerability assessments, uh, other offensive services kind of as needed. We can design and build them on the fly. So yeah, mostly pen testing focused though. And for my side of the business, uh, I handle all of the incident stuff that comes in through the door. So if you're a client of NCI and you have a ransomware attack, you're probably going to see my face, right? My job is to come back in, stand the company back up, put it back on its feet as quickly as possible. So let me tell you a little bit about Blue Team Alpha. Um, the Blue Team Alpha team has a ton of industry knowledge behind them. Um, CSSPs, uh, guys who work with DOD, DOD Prime, uh, we work with CMMC as that's coming out and becoming a thing. Lots of former uh, intelligence and uh, military backgrounds for threat hunting. We have some pretty sharp people working for us. Certified incident handlers, pen testers, all that good stuff. We have all those funny letters behind our name that no one knows what they are, including me most of the time. <laughs> Let's talk pen testing. Sure, so I uh, wanted to just have a quick discussion about um, some kind of pro tips in general. And if anybody has a question, please shoot your hand up. We can tackle those on the fly. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to kind of condense it down to what do, what do I get asked the most about and try to cover a pretty wide audience. So some of it might be kind of high level, some of it uh, may be new. Uh, what makes a great pen test? Uh, in my opinion, uh, I've looked at a lot of different ones over the years. Uh, I've seen a lot of people's reports through the course of pen tests. Uh, they're often on a network share and things like that. So pen testers see other reports quite often. Uh, it gives you a chance to kind of really compare what's out there and how are people you know, approaching things as a strategy. Um, the number one thing I think is uh, something I learned early on in my consulting career, which is just take a risk-based approach to how you're doing it, right? Uh, that means identifying what are, what are the likely impactful risks and developing a met methodology that will address that as a priority. Um, an analogy I'll use a lot talking about our, our different ways that we test is if we're, if we're looking at the windows and, and how secure they are and all the bad guys are coming in through the doors only, we're not doing you much good, right? We're wasting your time focusing on the wrong things first. Um, so that's kind of the, the premise of a risk-based approach. You know, the, the testing, the remediation efforts and things look like that shouldn't outweigh the actual risk that's there. Um, except for, you know, if it's a legal issue, compliance issue, or a safety issue. Uh, looking at the testing team, um, making sure they have, you know, adequate experience, um, you know, a decent amount of training, some professional certifications, or other, you know, backgrounds, degrees, or they've been through some boot camps and they've got a couple years of testing experience, you're usually going to get a pretty good skill set for, uh, you know, the things you need to know today to do it. Background in IT is especially helpful. Um, I did 15 plus years in IT before I really started doing pen testing and things like that. So it was a lot of fundamentals on the way. Um, and they should be founded on you know, best practice guidance. There's a lot of uh, industry standards with pen testing now that people can point to. Um, penetration testing execution standard is a big one. Um, NIST has a ton of guidance on it. PCI has a bunch of guidance on it. So there's plenty of uh, good standards to draw from. Um, the next section is what, what's a vulnerability scan versus a pen test and kind of delineating that. We get asked that a lot still. Uh, vulnerability scanning is, it works more like antivirus, right? It's looking for what it's programmed to know to find. So it's a, it's a signature database at the end of the day. A lot of them run a bunch of scripts and things like that too, so it's not just pattern matching. Um, but it's not going to take that finding and then necessarily exploit it, find something else and, and do kind of an attack chain kind of method. A pen test will do that, and the pen test is determining, you know, are there vulnerabilities, but then what is the impact in your unique environment of that vulnerability? Is it really there? Is it a false positive? Does it give us other, you know, other visibility that we find more stuff? A scanner won't do that, but a pen test will. Um, conversely, scanning is generally a lot cheaper, so if you haven't done that, I would start there. Don't have the pen testers find what a scanner can find. Um, you know, cost-efficient method there. Um, yeah, so then uh, what, when should you pen test, how often, or vulnscan? Um, scanning, 
My preference is to say every month if you can at least. If you can do it in house, that's you know, a way to get it done. There's a lot of tools out there that aren't hideously expensive, but you gotta have somebody to run it, interpret the results, and, and know what to do with, with those results. Um, pen testing, most people are doing once a year, um, or compliance-driven testing uh, cycles. Uh, quarterly is great if you have a big, complex environment and a lot of risk and a lot of sensitive um, information, you know, client data, things like that. Risk there should drive how often you're testing. If you're, <clears throat> pardon me, if you're testing both internal and external, split them up, right? Do, do them six months apart. Um, reason being that it gives you time to remediate one for the other, so you don't have a pile of results and then how do I do this, right? Yeah, most people don't have like a team of 12 people to do the remediation. <clears throat> it's usually the person that hired the pen testing firm or maybe a team of like two or three mm -hmm. with 30 other things going on, right? Managing operations with IT and, and dealing with other compliance things or, or what have you. So uh, you wanna generally stagger your testing so that it's timely to when you're gonna remediate. If you don't get to it for six months, then you might as well wait on scanning or testing till you're closer to that window so you have more time relevant results um, otherwise, you can end up chasing stuff that was old. What, meanwhile, you have a bunch of new stuff, too, that we didn't identify that maybe is a higher priority. So that's kind of it. That was kind of my overview of the, the most common pain points for people, just to try and get ahead of that a little bit. Um, yeah. Okay. Anybody got questions for Stefan? No? What his dog's name is? Anything like that? <laughs> Fine. Uh, incident response. So incident response we find comes in two major flavors. Um, there's lots of different types of incidents. We do get the opportunity to go into networks. We have an active threat actor, but for most cases, it's after the fact and it's too late, and that's when you see my face. Um, so there's business email compromises. Business email compromises, a threat actor gains access into your email system. Okay, doesn't sound too bad. You can read my email, right? So they hang out for a while, and they learn who the players are in the email, in the business. And once they figure that out, then they say, okay, well, John is my vendor, and John sends me an invoice and says, you need to pay your bill. Okay, so I go to pay my bill, and John sends me another email, and he says, hey, you know what, I changed banks. I need you to send it to a different bank account. That happens, right? Stakes are made, so I pay him. Two, three days later, John calls me. He says, hey, you gonna pay your invoice? <laughs> I did. I paid you. I didn't get anything. So we call the bank up, we start talking back and forth, and we discover that I got a bad route, right? The bad guy, acting as John, sent me, from his email account, sent me another invoice with their routing number on it, with their ACH information on it. And my money went to Bolivia or Russia or some other place. Can I get that back? Within the first three days, within, within three days, your bank and the Secret Service, depending on the, the amount, can usually claw that back without much problem. After three days, it gets sketchy. Maybe we can, maybe we can't. Maybe we can get part of it back. Um, did you know that Secret Service handled business email compromise? John did, because he's heard me talk before, right? <laughs> Secret Service, what an odd place to put it. Um, John can be compromised, I can be compromised, both of us could be compromised. Once they're in one place, they're gonna try to get in other places as well through phishing campaigns, coming from a known good address, right? Mindcast will deliver email from John, even though it's not John sending the email because it's a known good domain. And one thing that surprises a lot of people because ransomware is the big thing in the news, right? Ransomware, meatpacking plant, shut down. Oil pipeline, shut down. Hospitals, shut down. Municipalities, cities, shut down. Ransomware gets all the, all the love in the news. Business email compromise rakes in more cash for the threat actors than ransomware does. This is a multi-billion dollar industry. They have their own help desks. So if you're having trouble decrypting your files that you paid for, you can go to their help desk and they will help you decrypt the files. They have rating boards. Give us a five-star rating. 
They want a five-star rating so that the next person they ransomware, when they check them out, say, can I trust these guys? Yep, five-star rating. We gave them their data back, or at least the keys to decrypt it. So ransomware. Threat actor obtains access to the network. They elevate the privileges if they don't already have admin. They identify the sensitive data, so they're poking around in your network for a few days. You may or may not know they're there. It may look like your CEO or CFO or your network admin. Um, once they identify that data, they exfiltrate it, they take it. Why take your data? Because they can sell it to somebody else or they can extort you for more money so that it, your sensitive data doesn't wind up on their wall of shame. Because right? if you don't pay them, they'll publish your data. So you have to know what your da what data is and where it lives. Does everybody know where their sensitive data is on their network? I've seen head shakes. Are you sure? Talk to your marketing department. Do they know where all the data is? <laughs> Still your data. That vendor gets compromised, it's your data. Gotta know where it's at. Um, once they exfiltrate the data, then they'll ransom where the network. They'll throw that ransom off. Encrypt everything on the network. Scorched earth. Why do they do that? One, they can extort you for money to get your data back or to decrypt it. Um, and the other one is it makes it my job really hard because the logs get encrypted and, and all that kind of stuff. Not hard enough that we can't find what we're looking for forensic-wise, but it'd be great if they didn't do it at all, right? Um, extort money to not release the data. And what did I say? Might just ransom the network? Selling access. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Selling access. How many people have exchange on-prem? Yeah? What's your patch level? You don't do that? When you get back to work, ask your guys, are they patched up to the level? We've had 15, 15, 20 incident responses in the last month and a half that we've worked on. Back in March, there was Hafnium that was an exchange vulnerability, zero day. Microsoft put out patches, great. It's fixed, right? No. Attackers figured out they could hook three exploits together and get the same effect as Hafnium. They get access to your network. You don't know. And if your if exchange is out to the internet, you've probably been scanned and you may already be compromised. Why? <clears throat> Ransomware is a service. Now they have hundreds of thousands of exchange servers that are compromised and they sell access to them. Ransomware as a service, right? I'm gonna sell you access. Then you can go and exfiltrate the data, ransom the network, extort, have the insurance company pay a big whole bunch of money. Um, we do not recommend that you pay the ransom. If you do have a ransomware attack, don't immediately contact the threat actor. Let me do that. We may or may not pay them. We mess, may mess around with them long enough to find out what they actually have. So is it actual sensitive data? Did they steal your accounting data and your employee files? Or did they get your product catalog that's already on the web? Right? We don't want to play for the product catalog. Maybe we do with the others. We don't want to pay them at all. Yeah, real quick. You want to go back? Uh, just a quick comment here, too. If you look at you know, kind of the bullet points here, with business email compromise, most of that is external access, right? They get some credentials. You don't have MFA on your Outlook web access. They can log in from anywhere on the planet. And they'll usually live there for even up to months. I've seen it on some IRs. So a good external network pen test should incorporate these behaviors and these risks right, into the testing methodology. So you should be, when you're looking through you know, options for who's providing your testing, make sure they're touching on things that you know are the real you know, clear and present danger threats to your organization. It's these things primarily. right? There's a bunch of other stuff to consider too, but priority-wise, you're looking at it here. So they should be checking your, you know, if you have email exposed, there should be some commentary in there or some testing objectives that they look at some of that stuff with like reconnaissance and OSINT and things like that um, and enumeration processes. With ransomware, 
a lot of these steps line up awful close to how we do our internal network you know, assume breach pen testing. And we do that because we've modeled it after this kind of stuff. It touches the same things. It also touches the same things that an advanced persistent threat is going to be hitting. So we want to get you up to that water line so you are fairly well off against a sophisticated attacker because it also takes care of this stuff, which has become very highly automated at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So, How many people have O365? Okay. Do you, are you administrators for it? Yeah. Do you know that O365 has fairly good security? Do you know that Microsoft does not turn that security on by default? You have to go in and turn it on. You can click the button, it will give you a report, tell you what your security posture is, and things to do to fix it, to harden your email. But you have to go in and turn it on. A lot of people don't know that. Lots and lots of people don't know that. So if you didn't know that, don't feel bad. Um, so how do I avoid talking to Pete? <laughs> right? Because do you really want to see this face on the worst day of your business career? <laughs> right? They're happy when I leave, but nobody likes me when I show up. Um, how do you avoid talking to me? You have to have a vulnerability management program. How many, have, how many people have a vulnerability management program? A couple of hands, okay? It's not just patching. That's step one, right? The other side of that is vulnerability scans and pen tests. They come in a package, they run together. Um, vulnerability scans gives you criticals and highs, worry about those. The thousands of mediums and lows, not so much. Get rid of the critical stuff. Um, scanning once a month is what we recommend. More so if you do it once a quarter, you have time to fix it, right? Have time to, to patch the vulnerabilities and put the pieces in place that you need to. Um, because how many people have a security team? Okay, how many people are on your security team? You, you're the security team. How about you? Four, four people on your security team? That's really good, actually. Um, probably the highest I've heard of in months. Yeah. Usually security falls to IT. Oh, security, IT can do it. Guess what, IT has full-time jobs already. They may have two. <laughs> you know, how many hats do you wear? Security guy, just the one? You just. Uh-huh, yeah, security and. <laughs> There's not enough hours in the day, right? So a good security partner, right? At least somebody that can come in, look at your environment, learn about your business, and make recommendations of what to do next, right? And we know that money doesn't grow on trees. We all wish it does, but it doesn't. So a good security team will come in and say, do this first. Biggest bang for your buck, MFA. How many people have MFA? That's better than I thought. For those of you that don't know what MFA is, multi-factor authentication, if you're not using it at work, you should be. Go talk to your security teams and ask them why you can get to your, your email without having to approve it, right? That second authentication. Um, lost my train of thought. Um, backups. Backups, backups, backups. Did I mention backups? Backups. Offline, air-gapped, immutable backups. If you have good backups, if you have immutable backups that I can get to and the bad guy can't, I can stand your company back up in a matter of days. Industry average for a ransomware event is 21 days. What's that do to your business? If you can't do business for 21 days, what happens to your clients? They go to the competitor, right? because they have businesses to run of their own. Do they come back once you're at 21 days and your system's back up? No. We want to minimize that impact. We want to get you back on your feet as fast as we possibly can. I can't do that without good backups. I can rebuild all your servers, but without data to put on them, you're dead in the water. If you don't have backups or if the bad guy encrypts your backups and they will do that, I've seen it time and time again. I've had system admins Servers start dropping offline due to encryption, log into their networks, check their backup server, and watch the bad guy delete the restore points out of their backup server. And when he was done, 
He encrypted the backup server just as a little, you know, a little something extra for you. When he tried to kick him out, the bad guy caught him and kicked him out, locked him out of his own system, his own network. His uh, response to that was to puke in his garbage can. <laughs> I wish I was joking. <laughs> I really do. His, his uh, chief financial officer was standing behind me, and she's like, yeah, he totally did. It was not happy. Um, so backups. This will save your, your butt. The, the investment that you spend on doing either cloud-based or off-site immutable backups is worth every penny and will save you and save your insurance company tens of thousands of dollars. One, one real quick comment. Sorry, I keep doing yep. that to you. No, no, go ahead. Uh, speaking of insurance, and I think we got some more coming up about it. We do, yep. Vulnerability management program, a lot of insurers are building in rules where if you want to actually you know, get some support from your insurance policy, you've got to have some stuff in, in, in line or they're not going to pay you because you haven't been following their requirements to be covered. They it's happening more and more. They won't sell you a cyber insurance policy unless you meet those requirements. Multi-factor yep. authentication, good backups, vulnerability management program. Um, how do I prep to have, not to respond to, did I write this? How do I prep if I do have to respond to an answer? Oh, there we go. Um, have this in place. Trying to read backwards over my shoulder. Um, backups. Do you see a theme there? <laughs> and by the way, I've been preaching about backup since Windows 95, all right? Working for my dad. Dad, we got a backup. No, we're fine. Backups. You have to have an incident response plan. The last thing you want to do when your system is ransomware is try to figure out what to do next, what's your next step. You want that already planned out. You want to have tabletops. What's a tabletop? It's more than what you set your beer on, right? Tabletop exercise, we'll come in, take your incident response plan, build a theoretical incident, bring everybody that's involved around the table, and we'll walk through that incident. It takes about half a day. Sometimes it takes a whole day. Where's your data? What happened to it? Who does the communication? HR is always like, why am I at the table? How do people get paid? People like to get paid, you know, that's a, that's a big deal. Um, Payroll is always something we look at. Legal, who talks to the public? Do you have to report to the public? Are you a public traded company? Are you a healthcare system? Is it mandatory? Every state is different. Every state has their own rules for it. We engage uh, breach coaches, breach counsel, who are a team of lawyers that know all the rules in all the states. I don't know how they do it, but they do. Um, that help us talk about what happens during that breach. We practice that. Is it perfect? Nope. But it's a head start, right? And if you, if you do that and you have a good security partner and you know who to call, right? If everything goes to shit, find Pete. <laughs> you're ahead of the game. We get you up faster. Um, cyber insurance. You have to have cyber insurance. Anybody not have cyber insurance? Anybody have a cyber insurance policy that's about to renew? Yeah, have you been talking to your insurance pro provider? The insurance provider's got a whole list of requirements, doesn't he? MFA, huh? It grew. It grew. It, it got, got bigger. <laughs> our, our friends from North Risk are gonna talk way more about that coming up, but it's, you have to have it. Most companies cannot afford to recover and remediate the, the issues on their own. Anybody know what it costs for IR hours from my team? $400 an hour. And average, average incidents probably anywhere from 100 to 200 hours. You got that kind of cash laying around, and if you don't have good backups, you got to pay the you got to pay the threat actor, right? I think the most that I've personally seen on a request was four million, which we negotiated down to two million, and then we found backups that they didn't know they had, and we 
paid zero million. And we really enjoyed it. <laughs> I do not like paying bad guys. I haven't done it yet. I'm about to. I have a, a company in a southern state that all their backups were on their network. They backed up to the one server, seven PCs, small company, all their accounting data is on their network. They have a external storage, and the rest of the stuff backed up to the IT guy's laptop. Guess which computers they ransomed? Server, backups, backups. Don't have any backups. They don't have any of their accounting data. So we're probably gonna have to pay the bad guy to get the decryption key. They're not being charged four million, which is good. Um, cost plans are rising rapidly. Working with an HVAC company not too long ago, they said the cost of their cyber insurance policy increased, it was like 350 or 400% for their premium, right? It's expensive because paying ransom is expensive and the insurance agency simply can't handle it. Um, oh yeah, prereqs are getting more stringent. We talked about that, right? The list is getting longer. So not sure if you're under an attack. What are we looking for? Suspicious unexpected money transfers, business email compromise. My favorite one, these guys were really on the ball. The threat actor was really on the ball. They compromised a business email account, figured out who was who, fished the finance gal, the, the woman who ran finance, I shouldn't say finance gal, fished finance, saw the conversations between her and the CEO, and the CEO was going overseas on business. Here's my itinerary, this is where I'm gonna be the whole nine yards. So he's overseas, she gets an email at six o'clock in the morning that says, hey, I'm walking into this business meeting, I need you to transfer this money to the tune of you know, $500,000 to this bank account or this deal is gonna fall through. I'm gonna be in meetings, I'm not gonna be able to answer my phone. The attacker knew who he was meeting, what city he was in, what time the meeting was, everything checked out. And it came from his account. So she wired it. Later that day, she sent him an instant message and said, did they get the funds okay? I haven't heard anything from you. And he's like, what? <laughs> you did what? <laughs> we got it back, surprisingly enough. Um, suspicious unexpected vendor account change request. Hey, by the way, we got a new bank account. Here's the new one. Send the funds here. What's the proper response to that email? Anybody? Call, call them. Pick up the phone. Call them. Call that person that you know. Hey, did you? No, we didn't do that. Okay. And then report it so that we can trace the emails. Your, your IT team can trace the emails and see where it came from. Did it come from an external company? Did it come from their company? Because if it came from their email account, they have an email compromise. They need to know about that. And they're your vendor. You're buying stuff from them or selling stuff to them. You don't want them going underwater, right? Because that doesn't work either. Um, multiple failed login attempts. How many people have a seam? Okay. Who do you work for? Really? I'm impressed. It's like every question. She's like, I got this. I love it. I love it. Uh, a seam is a log aggregator with some intelligence behind it that will raise flags when things go wrong. They're expensive. They require care and feeding. They require a threat analyst. Um, you can outsource that to companies like Arctic Wolf. You know, there are companies that will do that for you. Monitored SOC, SOC as a service. Um, so it looks at multiple failed login attempts. You know, your CEO fails a login attempt with an IP address from Russia 200 times in 20 minutes. Huh, that's interesting. What's terrifying is he does it 200 times and the 201st time he makes it. And our friend, would the window shop is cringing. She knows what that means. Bad guys in your network. Uh, abnormal remote login sessions. A lot of firewalls and a lot of uh, uh, 
IAM systems will alert that you logged in in Fargo at 8.40 in the morning and you logged in in Tampa, Florida at 9. That's, that's not possible, right? I mean, I know there's some fast jets out there, but come on, right? The systems know that. You can't be in, virtually be in two places at the same time to log in, and they will alert on that. It may be that somebody's using a VPN and that endpoint is in Florida and that's where the IP is coming from. It happens, especially with work from home, but you need to check because 99% of the time it's not. Um, unauthorized email forwarding rules. Business email compromise. Office 365 will let you look at what your users are doing on their accounts. So if they are sending email to their home Gmail account so they can get to it easier, bypass having to log into Outlook with multi-factor and work on stuff at home, that's against your security policies, should be against your security policies, um, and you need to know that, right? The bad guys will also do this. They will compromise, they compromise John's email account. I'm picking on John because I know John. They compromise John's email account. They, they get his user ID and password and they set up rules that automatically forward his email to an external Gmail account. And they do it on the server, it never shows up on his desktop, he never knows that that rule's in place. You can't fight that. Then when they start their email campaigns, they put rules in that sends email with subject header that they're sending out under, and they make that go to a, a dead Dropbox so it never shows up in his inbox. So if he's getting replies back, he doesn't know it. That's one of the first things we look for in a business email compromise. Are there rules that shouldn't be there? Um, logins from an unfamiliar domain. Why am I getting logins from Russia, China, Iran? You probably have a problem. Turn on geofiltering on your firewalls. Office 365 and your, and your login acceptance rules. If you don't do business in Russia, you don't need to be able to log into it from Russia or have Russia access you. It just doesn't make sense. Does it stop the bad guy? No, because they can use a VPN to the US and do it from the US side, but it's another step. Bad guys like really easy things. If you make it hard, they'll go someplace else. That's what security is. We build fences. We make it harder to get to you than from the next guy down the street. Uh, unopened files, unopenable files. I'm trying not to cough and blow everybody's ears up. <laughs> unopenable files, if you get an email and it has a PDF attached to it and you try to open that PDF and it doesn't open, you should probably report that. Or if it opens and asks for credentials, you need to log into Office 365. Probably a problem. <laughs> I'd, I'd add to that, if it wants you to enable macros or allow any kind of access and you weren't expecting it and know who it's from and can still double check it, don't touch it. Have your security team look at it or pick up the phone and call that person and make sure it's legit. Mm -hmm. That's all it takes to get in. Increase quantity and quality of phishing attempts. They will do targeted phishing campaigns aimed at your C-suite or aimed at your IT guys or aimed at your finance people. Why does finance get picked on? Because finance knows where the money is. Right? They have access to it, they shuffle it around between accounts, finance gets picked on. Everybody's gotten bad phishing attempts, right? Words are misspelled, really easy to pick out. Right? Anybody got real good ones? Like the one that looks like an Office 365 login? Just like an Office 365 login? I've had students create phishing campaigns that I had to pull them back because I said, we're, we're going to get arrested. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, doing, we're doing pro bono work with nonprofits, and you're going to fish them, and if you send that out, we're getting arrested. They're, they're that good. And, these, and they're students. They're, they're rookies. The pros are beyond good at it. Um, duplicate invoice complaints from multiple customers. I already paid this, I already paid this, I already paid this. You have a problem. Find Pete. Questions? Oh, come on, we gotta have some questions. You guys are, are you a ransomware broker? No. 
we are not a broker. We, we can do that. We will contact the, the threat actor, um, more so to find out what they have. We've had cases where everything looks like it's ransomware, but they just got to the point of changing the file names before they encrypted them, and we could just change the file names back on half of it. Um, we've had instances of doing that where um, when we talk to them, they act like, well, we have everything, and, and what they have is an online catalog, and they didn't actually get your, your uh, PHI or PII out of your business, right? your employee information, that kind of stuff. And it also helps that we can talk to them and have experience with saying, no, no, this, this company can't afford four million, you know, that kind of stuff. Third party gets in the middle of it, it gets a little easier. We've, we've had clients reach out and tell them, you know, we can't afford that. And had the threat actor sent their balance sheet to them, yeah, you can. <laughs> oh, bad time. I make jokes about it because I have to make the jokes now because when, it's, when it, you're sitting across the table from somebody that's watching their future and the future of all their employees go down the toilet, they really aren't in a joking manner. Do you guys do vulnerability remediation like schedule as opposed to just incident response also? Um, yes, we have remediation services for, for vulnerabilities as well. Yep. Is so. That a different price point to the incident response? Yes. Typically. Yeah. That is significantly less expensive than seeing me. <laughs> Right? If you want to see somebody, go see Stefan. He's, he's way more affordable than I am. <laughs> yep. SWAT team's expensive. Yep. Yep. I have guys. We just had a guy move to San Diego, so I have people in all four coasts and in Central. So we're distributed all over the place. I can be anywhere inside of the United States within 24 hours. I'm usually there within 12 and I can be anywhere globally within 72, generally. Luckily, we don't have to go globally very often. We stick to the US pretty much. One other, I can drop another just comment. If you want to back up a slide real quick. So one thing that came to mind for me is, um, you know, when you're talking about the increased quality of phishing attempts, which is generally how you end up with a business email compromise, right? Some kind of social engineering or thing like that. Um, they are phishing MFA numbers and stuff like that as well these days. So if you have a hardware-based MFA, you're probably a little better off there uh, from that particular attack vector. But like Office 365, right? Punch in the code, off to the races. Well, phishers do that now, and they simulate that whole process. So they'll get your creds, may or may not even check if those are valid, and then they'll get the MFA. Some of them even relay it in real time, and, and they're in the second you punch it mm -hmm. in. So they've really weaponized that stuff. Now, that doesn't mean MFA is not worth it. Again, it's another fence in front of the, in front of your, the goods, right? Um, but what keeps you protected there is if you have log event alerting, monitoring, and correlation, a SIM of some sort, right? Some kind of thing checking for outlier events in your, in your organization to catch things like that. Okay, they got through the MFA, but it's coming from, you know, Russia or anywhere that's Uzbekistan. abnormal. The timing might be abnormal because they're in a wildly different time zone, right? There will be anomalous stuff to do with it, indicators that you can, that can catch it at the front instead of when they're in for 30 days and you know, edit your wiring instructions template with a different account number and then you send $4.2 million to Africa, mm -hmm. which I've seen before. So, um, I've, I've seen yeah. threat actors in, the, in a network for 18 months is the record of how long they were in their network. Around. I think some of the longest I've heard um, when I was doing some forensics training a number of years ago now, even mm -hmm. back then, I'm talking like five years ago, I think, they were talking, they've seen over 900 days where there's not even a callback. They have access, they have an implant somewhere, and it wasn't even checking in for more than like once every 600, 900 days. Mm -hmm. They're patient when they want to be. So, What's the biggest vulnerability that you have? people, right? Always. Spend money on security awareness training. Fish them. Constantly. I used to run fishing programs that I would fish the entire company over the span of a month. And also during that month, I would fish everybody in the company over the span of a week. I did that for two reasons, because when you fish over the span of a month, it 
doesn't hit real fast like the week does, and you don't get the, the pop-up gopher thing, the person that stands up over the cue wall and goes, did you get a phishing email? Then everybody knows, everybody's on alert. Your numbers don't match as much, but trickle out through the month, um, and we did it continuously, and we gamified it. If you caught me trying to fish you, and it was the first time you did it, and you hit the report phishing button, and we verified that, yep, that's a phishing email, first time you did it, we'd give you a t-shirt. And the t-shirt had Admiral Akbar on it and said, it's a trap. <laughs> <clears throat> you could wear them at work, and they were coveted. I mean, and they'd get the confirmation that they, that they won one and would be at the help desk minutes later, where's my t-shirt? <laughs> it was great. It was a t-shirt, you know, like six bucks, come on. Well, in a small lawsuit, because we didn't have license for Admiral Akbar, but, you know. Um, but yeah, security awareness training. Train them what to look for. Um, and, I'll, and I'll say this too. Train them to be safe at home. What do you do when your credit card gets hacked? Somebody gets your credit card number. What do you do when someone's in your Gmail? How do you secure your credit? Do you know you can freeze your credit with all three of the big companies? There's actually a fourth one out there now that's smaller, but with all three of the big ones, you can freeze your credit. It doesn't cost you anything. How often do you need a credit check? How often do you buy a car? How often do you buy a house? If you're going to do that, unfreeze it, let them run the credit check, freeze it again. That way, if they do get your social security number, they do get access to your accounts, they can't open anything because your accounts are frozen. Right? By doing that, you're securing your employee at home, and that good cyber hygiene is going to come to work with them. Because a guy who's trying to figure out how to feed his kids because the bank is going to take three weeks to get his money back isn't a good employee. He's not focused on work. All right. So train them. October is Cyber Security Month, Cyber Security Awareness Month. SANS has fantastic training. I encourage you all to go out and take a look at it. And if you do have an incident, talk to people about it. Talk to other companies that are in your industry. I don't know why, but HVAC has been the target over the last month. I think I've had five or six HVAC companies. I don't know if they're trying for another target or, or what, but it's like, why all of a sudden HVAC of all places? Um, but they're the targets. Another thing I like to bring up when you're, when you're talking about you know, protecting your, your, t your team, your workforce, and, and their home lives is uh, we see this a lot on pen tests too. Uh, not on purpose, it's just kind of the nature of how you do it with the technology, but they get onto your systems and they're dumping password hashes in memory, people's cookies from their browser and stuff. They, they have access to all of your users' data for any system they've compromised, right? But what if they're using that to log into their personal accounts, do their banking during lunch break or whatever? They're gonna have a lot of personal stuff on their work machine, inevitably. So now that's all exposed too, potentially, and they can be impacted. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it gets bad. We've even seen where you, know, you have an incident, remediate everything, clean it all out, stand them back up, and then you know you, you got somebody in IT at home whose system at home was already compromised too, and they were just you know lying in wait to get back in, and they get right back in, and it's all you know start from step one again. So yeah, it's bad enough seeing my face once. You really don't want to see it twice. <laughs> Way less fun. And, and we've had it happen, <laughs> right? That's another thing. They'll ransomware you. You don't pay it, but they got into your systems. They will sell that to another ransomware gang. Most companies that go through ransomware get ransomware again within 30 to 60 days. If they don't fix the holes in the first place, right? And that's, we make sure we fix the holes that they came in before we leave. Otherwise, our good friends in the insurance agency would kick us in the shins. Thank you. Uh, you said see Stefan before they see you. Yes. See Stefan before you see me, because that gives me a lot better opportunity to market company for cyber insurance, so you're not going to get that 300% increase mm -hmm. that, that you settled for. Yeah. 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 Insurance knows all about taking a risk-based approach. They're the experts at it, ultimately. So uh, it definitely helps to take your own risk-based approach and prep for when you want to get that policy, and everybody's going to have a much better time. <laughs> yep. You don't have to be perfect with cybersecurity. You can't afford to be perfect with cybersecurity. You get to a point where to get to the next step is so cost prohibitive that it doesn't, you just don't go there. Not unless you're a major enterprise. But you can do things 
to protect yourself. Backups, vulnerability management, pen tests. Know where your holes are. Don't be afraid to look. It's okay if you find weakness in your network. If we know it's there, we can fix it. Right? Not knowing is... Yeah, plausible deniability. <laughs> I, I have some legal eagles who would argue. <laughs> One of them is married to our CEO, and yeah, it's, it's, it just doesn't cut it anymore. So, any other questions? No? We do have business cards up here if you want one. So, if you do have to call Pete, you know how to get a hold of me. Um, other than that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.